Now that you have watched the introductory video, we can get into some of the specifics of Category 1 proposals. Before you get too far into a new course proposal, make sure that you have had a chat with your program coordinator and the department head to make sure that the idea has support. Also feel free to run it by the curriculum coordinator, that would be me, if you need help with filling out forms. Your proposal first has to go to your program committee for approval and then your coordinator will send it to me and Jen for posting on the faculty website. This gives everyone else in the faculty the opportunity to comment. The proposal will also go to the Undergraduate Programs Planning and Coordination Committee for all program coordinators and the Associate Dean to see. Once it gets approved there, the Dean takes a look and then it gets sent by me to the Senate Curriculum Committee and then on to the full Senate. Needless to say, if you're proposing a new program, there are a lot more steps and paperwork, but for now we'll just follow a new course proposal as that is what we deal with the most. There are a lot of documents required with a new course proposal, but you as the proposer are only responsible for the proposal form and the syllabus. Jen takes care of the consultations and budget forms. Thanks, Jen. We went over the proposal form in detail in the last video, so let's jump right to the syllabus. Bobette sends out the syllabus template every term, so please make sure you use the most recent version. This template has been approved by Senate, so it is the official version. From experience, I can say that there are often discrepancies between the proposal form and the syllabus for the academic calendar entry, which is the course description in the calendar. So please make sure that you double check that they are the same before you submit the forms. The template offers a great opportunity to think through your course and figure out how and why it will work before you actually teach it. Of course, there will be lots of revisions after your first run through of the actual class, but the syllabus shows the proof of concept for your proposed course. Thinking through the objectives and learning outcomes at this stage will really help you develop a stronger course. The course overview, content, and objectives part of the syllabus is what you plan to do as an instructor how you intend to conduct the course, what topics you will cover, how the course format will be realized, and so on. The learning outcomes, on the other hand, are focused on the learning rather than the teaching end of things. So often they are introduced with the phrase, upon successful completion of this course, the student should be able to do whatever the outcome is. Learning outcomes should avoid verbs like understand, know, or learn, and instead use active verbs like demonstrate, apply, analyze, synthesize, evaluate, create. Bloom's taxonomy is a good place to find active verbs that you can use for learning outcomes, and the UBCO Center for Teaching and Learning has some great workshops on how to develop and write strong learning outcomes. The CTL recommends that there be 5 to 12 outcomes in a 3 credit course. Keep in mind that outcomes should be measurable, achievable, and tied to the assessment plan for the course. The next part of the syllabus template relates to the assessment plan and then the readings and schedule. A clear explanation of the assessment criteria and mark distribution must be provided. If you noticed in the previous slide, it states that if participation marks count for more than 5%, an explanation is required. I would recommend both a clear justification and a rubric for how the participation mark will be awarded, especially if you are planning on making the mark out of more than 10% of the entire course evaluation. There's a place farther down on the template where you will need to provide final exam information. If it's a third or fourth year class, an exam is not required, so just make a note under the final exam section of the template if there is no exam, and leave out the rest of the blurb about dates and concessions. However, university policy states that all first and second year courses, except studio courses, should have a final exam. 
If you're not planning an exam for your first or second year course, you'll have to get permission from the associate dean, and it would be a good idea to also provide a rationale on the proposed syllabus in case the curriculum committee has questions about the lack of exam. The required readings must be listed, but of course this list will change from year to year. The library, usually your subject librarian, will check to see that your required readings are available. You can also provide recommended readings, but don't make the list so exhaustive that the committee questions how much you are expecting students to read. The committee is vigilant about protecting the students and making sure that they are not asked to do more than can reasonably be expected. While the weekly schedule is again tentative and will possibly change with each iteration of the actual course, the Senate asks for a detailed weekly schedule with topics to be covered, showing that you have thought through the course. Required readings and exam dates should be listed on the weekly schedule. Consultations are done with the library, as well as any external faculty, department, or unit that would have an interest in or be affected by the proposal. Usually the library consult comes back with the remark that additional acquisitions will be required but that the library can support the requests. And obviously that's how the collection grows. If the proposal cannot be supported with existing resources, that doesn't necessarily mean it can't go ahead, but you do need the signature of the chief librarian. For consultations with other faculties, we will almost always send the proposal to the barber school, but if you think there are other faculties or schools, such as management, education, or health and social development that might be impacted or have useful feedback, then please indicate that when you submit the proposal. If the consultations come back requesting changes or additional information, then I will be in touch with you as we need to report back what action, if any, is taken on these comments. The proposal could potentially be turned back at the Senate Curriculum Committee stage if appropriate consultations are not done. Jen takes care of filling out and sending these forms, so you don't have to worry about that. But it would be helpful if you made suggestions about where consultations should be sent in case we are unaware of impacts on other faculties. The budget impact form lets everyone know that the department, faculty, and the library have sufficient resources to support the course. Again, Jen will fill it out and get the heads and deans signatures. If additional resources are required, additional signatures are also required. The curriculum committee will not look at any proposals that are not complete, so if you need additional financial resources to support your course, you need to line that up before you submit your proposal. So that's the rundown on a Category 1 proposal. Thanks for taking the time to watch this tutorial, and I hope you found it helpful.